Thank you very much, Anthony, and welcome everyone to this webinar on Fever of Unknown Origin. And I'm going to start this talk with a simple question. Is this concept still valid? And my talk is directed at that question. Is this concept still valid? Um, I'm going to start with a case uh, for us to ponder, uh, to think about. And then using this, I'm going to use that as a springboard into what is fever, an approach to chronic fever, an approach to uh, sorry, approach to acute fever, then approach to chronic fever. And I'll finish off with a summary and hopefully uh, an answer to the question. So here's, here's the case that you've been presented with uh, today. Uh, Brogan is a 16-week-old male Irish setter. Um, he's had a day of clinical signs. You can read the history there. Um, he's unwell, but not that unwell. Um, his owner is very, very worried. She's had a child with febrile seizures, and she's very frightened of fever, and she's very worried that Brogan is going to develop febrile seizures um, like children do. Um, he is not housed with any other, uh, any other dogs. You examine him. His temperature is 40.5, um, which in old money is 104.8 or something. Um, he's subdued. He's reluctant to move, but there's no pain, no swelling, no masses, no lymph node enlargements, no discharge. He just looks like a sickish puppy. So uh, a question now for you, um, to which we will turn over to the poll. What would you do with Brogan? Would you monitor him for the next four or five days and re-examine him? Give some treatment and re-examine him? Monitor him and do some tests and wait for the results? Or do some tests and treat him whilst waiting for the results? If we could turn over to the poll now, Chris. Right, okay, just uh, letting people vote at the moment, Ian. I lost the poll questions wherever they'd gone, so thanks, Chris, for starting that off for me. Uh, what would you do with Brogan? Would you monitor for four days and um, re-examine? Give some treatment and re-examine. Do some tests and wait for the results. Do some tests and treat whilst waiting for the results. Now, um, there isn't the right answer, I should have said. Yeah. Which... which um, Chris, I'm not seeing the poll here, so you must uh, have that somewhere. Can you can you just go through the uh, the numbers for people? Okay, so zero percent say monitor four days and re-examine. Forty-six percent say give some treatment and re-examine. Seventeen percent say do some tests and wait for results and 37% do some tests and treat whilst waiting for results. So, that, so what was the, uh, the first, the first I, one? I've got them again. Nobody, <laughs> nobody said monitor for four days and re-examine. Then 45% said give some treatment and re-examine. 17% said do some tests and wait for the results. And 38% said do some tests and treat whilst waiting for the results. So. The most popular answer okay. is give some treatment and re-examine and then Number do some two. tests and treat whilst waiting for the results. Great. Okay. So, um, uh, I, I may, I've asked this question many times. This result does not surprise me. Um, uh, the veterinary profession is uh, as split as the medical profession are on the approach and dealing with an acute feverish animal for which there is no apparent localizing signs. Um, uh, some people treat, some people do tests, some people do treat and tests, and um, uh, uh, and perhaps there, there is an argument um, uh, for 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 um, not doing so much. So let's just think about fever just for a moment uh, and what's going on in Brogan. In Brogan's brain, there is a thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus, and if that the blood supplying there gets too hot. Uh, it will induce uh, responses to cool Brogan down, and if um, uh, it gets too cold in there, then uh, the, there will be responses to warm Brogan up. Fairly straightforward. And if we uh, have a hyperthermia where heat generation exceeds our ability to lose heat, um, uh, then um, it, it's very simple. There's a set point in the hypothalamus, and as that temperature goes up, so there is a normal response. 
However, there is no safety net. Okay, if that heat goes up too high, um, typically above 41 degrees centigrade or so, things start dying. And uh, hypothermia is a fatal disease um, if it is allowed to, to go too high. Um, and of course, equally, although we're not talking about this today, hypothermia. That level of fever, can, that level of high temperature can be sustained for a short period um, without too much damage. This is a very interesting study from 2009 looking at the effect of exercise on uh, normal Labrador retrievers, Labrador retrievers with in exercise induced collapse and um, uh, it shows that um, uh, the temperatures that go up in these animals are uh, no, not significantly different but look at those temperatures. We're talking here after um, uh, exercise of, of about uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes duration, albeit admittedly this study was done in a hot climate, um, of a Labrador's temperature going up to 42 degrees centigrade. Mean temperature, 42 degrees centigrade. So we can survive those high temperatures for a short time, providing we can then cool down straight away after, afterwards. In fever, something changes. There's a different point. And that is that the normal set point increases. So when we get to that new set point, the initial reaction is one that the body feels as if it's cold. And so we start to shiver, to shake, to behave, to curl up. We, we go and hide in bed. And that ups the temperature. And now we feel okay. And most of us will have had that experience um, when we've had a fever of shivering and cold. And then it, you feel all right for a while. But then this new set point is not fixed. It starts to fluctuate. And so you get the set point going down. Now you feel hot. Now you feel sweaty. The temperature comes down. The set point goes back up again. Now you feel cold. And it's actually the degree of fluctuation which will determine how you feel. If there is no fluctuation in that new set point, you don't feel too bad. So the question is, does this process benefit Brogan? Does Brogan benefit from being pyrexic? Is, is he better off being pyrexic? So again, uh, yes or no, simple question. Does Brogan benefit from being pyrexic? So just let people uh, vote away. <clears throat> if you can just quickly make your minds up on this, we'll let it run for another five, ten seconds, and then we'll let it, uh, let it go. Right, okay, so we've got... 73%, 71% saying yes, he does, and 29% uh, saying no, he doesn't. Okay, then. Um, so I think what we're seeing there is that there's a, a clear realization that um, there are some benefits from being pyrexia. Pyrexia is incredibly old in evolutionary terms. Birds do it, and even bees do it. Bees, if their hive is invaded by a fungus, will beat their wings faster, raise the temperature of the hive. They'll do it quite deliberately. And if they are successful in raising their temperature of their hive quickly enough, they will survive. The fungus will be driven away. And if they are unsuccessful, or rather you make them unsuccessful by putting a cooling coil inside the hive, then actually the hive will die. Every endothermic animal can do it. Many ectothermic animals uh, can, do it, can do it. Uh, so reptiles and so forth can, can do it, and even some non-vertebrates. It's an incredibly old thing. Why would we keep that ability if it wasn't for good? Fever enhances white blood cell activity. It makes uh, the immune system work better, work harder. Um, it, 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 it enhances the uh, um, acute phase protein response, inducing free radical scavenging.